Hello and welcome to another one of my investor videos. For those of you that don't know me, I'm the Money Sponge on Twitter and I'm a junior resources investor, predominantly in the oil and gas and mining sectors. Many of the stocks that I talk about would be deemed high risk due to low liquidity, low market caps and generally being early stage companies. So please don't rely on the information in the videos, please just use them as helpful research where I present the companies and I present the investment case for the companies from my perspective only. So today I'm going to be talking about Armadale Capital PLC and uh, it's a recent investment that I've made uh, and the company is listed on the junior uh, AIM segment of the London Stock Exchange and its market cap is 5 million ticker ACP. So they are a junior AIM listed resource investing company. Their primary focus is on the potentially world-class Mahenge Liandu Graphite project in Tanzania, which they 100% own. They have some other investments uh, in, their, in their portfolio, but these are really sort of legacy-based. One of them is an unlisted uh, African investment uh, vehicle, and the Mapokoto uh, Gold project um, in Africa as well, which they've actually now got a, a project royalty agreement on of one and a half percent. There's a bit of legacy. I was previously invested in this company uh, a few years back in relation to the gold project, but the previous management didn't seem to really carry this forward uh, satisfactorily for me. So I did, I did actually uh, exit the investment. However, uh, the company is in a new place now with new people running the company and uh, the graphite project is particularly interesting to me because this is an area that I wanted to have exposure to um, given the uh, upcoming EV revolution and other developments in the graphite space. Um, so the board, uh, it, it, we've got a revised board with a new strategy and focus. We're, we're focusing on the, the graphite project, which is a very compelling project, which we'll go through in detail in a second. Um, the good thing is the board have a 22.5% um, holding in the company. So they are shareholder aligned, which is uh, very impressive. Uh, the company recently appointed SI Capital as the broker who um, facilitated the strategic financing and it's worth noting that the company only took half of what was offered by investors as obviously they, real, they deemed it that they didn't need to take any more and would rather not dilute shareholders and the company further by taking cash it didn't need at the current level. So that was executed at 1.1 pence per share. Share price as I speak today is around about 135. So the share price has experienced an uplift since the raise. And I think that's um, probably due to the fact that the company have uh, outlined what their plans are for the year and, uh, and the roadmap, which we'll also talk about a bit later. So before we talk about the actual project itself, it's worth having a look at the graphite market. So I've done a little bit of research on this and um, there's a great uh, research note out by SP Angel on the graphite market. And if you search the um, Twitter feed of Armadale Capital, you'll see that they've actually posted a link to it. And um, it's a very interesting article to read through to understand the dynamics of the graphite market historically and going forwards. So typically historic demand for graphite has been driven by the industrial market. However, the EV battery boom and the EV market itself is set to increase demand going forwards. So this is a, a, an interest from an investor's perspective, uh, much as uh, nickel and copper are and cobalt, for example, especially in the EV space. Um, an interesting thing pointed out is that China has become a net importer of graphite. So they have graphite projects, but they've um, various regulatory and cleaning up their um, you know, becoming more greener and what have you has um, led to reduction in those and therefore China in terms of their consumption will have to be importing graphite from other regions and other countries. The pricing itself, well much like other metals for example copper and nickel and, and, and you know other commodities, um, Prices are coming off historic lows. So this is an interesting level for investors to get exposure to, uh, to graphite. 
Um, the demand growth that's predicted uh, in a number of um, sort of charts and, and forecasts that I've seen supports an increase in prices. And um, typically, graphite will be basket based pricing um, due to the various different types of uh, you know, graphite flake sizes and purity that you, that you have. So uh, a point to note really is that larger flake sizes will command higher end prices and this is the sort of like premium product. The outlook remains positive uh, for graphite and graphite producers. Um, it's worth noting that you know there are new projects coming to market as well so um, you know that demand will somewhat be um, supplied but however you know if, if the demand increases as we expect with the EV um, uh, demand going up then uh, you know the investors should be in a good place with graphite. So the second thing to talk about really around about the market is homing on, re homing in really on on sort of the end uses. So a key one is uh, you know EV lithium iron batteries and um, the battery market in 2017 accounted for 25% of global graphite supply and that's significant really because if the EV market is set to boom uh, and you know we see every day now stories of more and more motor manufacturers going to switch completely to EV then um, you can see a strong uh, demand coming from that sector and given that it's 25% already in 2017 this could uh, be very interesting for the graphite market itself. Graphite is actually the major component of uh, the various different battery combinations, as you can see there on some of those um, charts that I've posted. Um, it's a dominant material and it's required for the anode, so it's not going anywhere anytime soon. I mean, there obviously will be advances in EV batteries going forward. I'm sure there'll be disruptive stuff coming to the market, but for now, this is where we're set and uh, graphite's in a good place. Um, natural flake graphite is processed into sort of spherical graphite, which is then uh, put into the anodes of the batteries. Uh, larger flakes are more uh, effective than smaller flakes, so uh, hence why I was talking about the prices being higher for those. But different flake sizes can be used, it's just the, the, the higher flakes will get the higher pricing. Uh, growth of the EV market and energy storage market, which is another area of interest, has the implications really for um, graphite and for other other base metals as well. So we're very much moving to an you know, electric dominated um, power um, world um, if you discount um, you know, other, other, other you know, commodities like uranium for example. Um, expandable graphite and graphene are rapidly emerging um, products and technologies, uh, somewhat disruptive, and their usage is set to increase as well. So this puts further demand on graphite itself. So it's an interesting space to be in, and you know, for a while I've been looking at this space and looking at uh, various different opportunities, and this is why. Uh, ACP has become of interest to me. So the project itself, okay, so it's uh, the Mahenge Liandu um, graphite project in Tanzania. It's potentially a world-class graphite project. It's 100% owned by the company as well. It's one of the large, uh, one of the highest grade large flake deposits globally, which is interesting because it's not something I realize that ACB had until I started delving deeper and doing, and doing research. And it's got a short resource of 51.5 million tonnes at a very high grade of 9.3%, but with a, 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 a head mining grade of up to 12% in the earlier years. And this feeds through into the economics, which are very compelling and which we'll be looking at in shortly. Um, it's high purity and excellent flake size distribution by comparison to other projects and producers in the region. Um, they're looking at a 400,000 tonne per annum plant over a 32 year mine life and this is notably based on just 25% of the prospective resource. So there's huge scope for expansion here and to expand the project out as the company develop the project uh, and that's uh, an interesting investment perspective uh, uh, 
you know, in itself uh, because it means that there's potential growth there. It's close to local infrastructure and neighbouring producing mines. Um, it's a prolific region, so therefore, um, you know, it's de-risked by that in itself as well. The current status of the project, well, they're currently doing, uh, well, they sorry, they've completed product quality drilling uh, recently, and that will feed in, the results of that will feed into a test work program, and this will um, be uh, applicable to the uh, offtake uh, that they're looking at. And they, they've got an offtake MOU signed with a Chinese uh, client, and that's now pending um, review of the test work and should that be successful they can move to a binding agreement so we we'll, should be getting news on that um, the uh, they're going to be upgrading the reserves as well so they've completed drilling over the, the last six months and what we want to see there and what I'm hoping for there is to see an upgrade in the reserves from inferred and indicated to the measured category and this is something that obviously financiers will be interested in as well. They'll be progressing the uh, environmental and social permitting aspects of the project to culminate in a, a mining license, uh, which is obviously the go signal for them um, to project progress to um, construction and production. And they completed the scoping study on the project and now they're actually uh, in the process of the feasibility study, the definitive feasibility study. So that is underway and that's what the funding was there for and it's fully funded 2019. So a bit more about the project and its economics. So this is extremely interesting to me and why this company has caught my eye, even though I believe the company itself is under the radar and perhaps has previously suffered from legacy, uh, you know, le legacy management and um, the previous focus of the company. It has a headline MPV of $349 million. Uh, it has a low capex of $35 million. Now that creates an MPV ratio of um, 1 to 10 capex MPV. Now, I've done a fair bit of research on a fair, fair number of companies. I'm not sure I've seen a ratio uh, just quite like that. Um, typically, companies that I've been looking at, and these are still good economic stories, and um, you know, you, you, you don't just invest in, in invest for the headline numbers, you invest for the forward view on the company and where you think that commodity might be in terms of uh, ramping up those, uh, those, those valuations and the free cash flow, ultimately. But as a base case, using a concerted basket price. They are saying, uh, you know, the, the, the figures are there, 35 million capex versus 349 million MPV. I, I can't find another company like that and I don't think it's gonna be very easy to find. So this is extremely exciting to me. And an IRR of 122, 122% uh, with a 1.2 year payback, bearing in mind it's a 30 year, a 32 year mine life on 25% of the results. So this is, you know, extremely uh, compelling. Now, there's some peer comparisons I've done. These were accurate, uh, you know, a, a month or so ago. Um, and you can see there that Armadale, uh, amongst some other Tanzanian um, mining companies there, is sitting significantly below the valuation of those companies. Um, yet, in terms of some of them, it, it's at the same stage or similar stage, similar resource grades, etc., etc. So, you know, you've got some peers there that are valued, um, you know, two to three or four times the, uh, the valuation of Armadale. And um, this is interesting. And again, another thing that's attracted me um, to, to the company is its low valuation currently for the potential of the project. So wrapping up on the project itself then, so um, you know, we talked about what it's about, we looked at the economics um, and peer comparisons, what, what, what makes um, the Mahenge Liandu uh, graphite project stand out? Well, um, in comparison to some of those peers, um, it's the high end of the, of the purity and the large flake size. Um, so that's very interesting from a, a product perspective um, because it should mean that the pricing um, is favourable, and um, you know, uh, you know, one of the, one of the highest mined head grade graphite deposits 
um, at 12% is is sort of market leading, and when you you know that results in a low OPEX cost of $400 per ton, which is sitting at the lower end of the cost curve by comparison to other companies as well. So you've got low end cost curve, high end purity and flake size, a perfect combination. And this is obviously all output from the scoping study. We want to see the, the definitive feasibility study you know, backing up these uh, these figures. But from uh, an early stage investor perspective at the moment, this is very interesting. And the, as I said in the scoping study, the basket price of 1300 was used, which is um, regarded as conservative. And um, yeah, this would result in high margins because obviously you can see there, you know, $400 per tonne versus $1,300 per tonne. So it's extremely high margin. Okay, so that's pretty much the project itself. So moving on to the roadmap, what can we expect from the company? What can we expect to start driving value out for investors if you're looking for value, which is obviously what we're all here for. Um, so the roadmap as I see it, um, based on RNSs and recent um, news announcements is, we have the DFS in flight, so that's due for completion Q4 2019. Um, the company have made a point in saying they have high confidence in carrying forward the scoping study result uh, and economics in, into the DFS, given that the scoping study actually was only completed a while back. Um, so. Um, that's very exciting because um, the DFS will actually um, put firm numbers around the project and uh, what you quite often see with other companies is that when they produce scoping studies or, or uh, preliminary economic assessments three or four years before they produce the, the, the feasibility study you can quite you can often see quite a movement in the numbers uh, particularly capex given the costs of raw materials and power etc have all increased in that time frame but this what's good here is is that the scoping study is very close to the DFS and therefore um, there's higher confidence in those numbers uh, be, being there. Um, metallurgical results um, as part of the DFS and product quality results to confirm flake size distribution etc um, and potential um, that is not something the company have really talked about, but something that I can see as a possibility, given that Horizonte Minerals did the same thing with their DFS, um, is like a stage two process where um, they can expand the project out, given that the, uh, the original um, scoping study is based on 25% of the resource, there's another 75% prospective resource there that's untapped. So you could, uh, you could plug in a stage two operation, which would in significantly increase the annual uh, tonnage per annum, and of course the uh, resultant free cash flow. So this project MPV could be way higher. Um, I mean, the capex would move up as well, but um, we could be looking at a significant um, value in this project. We would expect a Jork resource update as well. So they've completed the recent drilling program. So what I want to see there is I want to see uh, inferred uh, and indicate resources converted to the measure category and the company have commented on this and said that that's what they're doing, um, at least to uh, cover a measured resource for a 10 year mine life, which uh, is enough to go to um, you know, the financing companies and say, yeah, we've got the resource there, it's been measured, uh, we've done the drilling, um, so you can uh, uh, be comfortable lending us the money, uh, which we're going to be paying back in 1.2 years anyway. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, offtake to conversion of the MOU with the Chinese company to a binding agreement. And this will be, uh, this should, this should uh, happen following the test work program completion, which we'll get news on. Uh, client um, looking at the end product, uh, looking at the quality of the product, and should that be uh, amenable, the uh, you know the 30k, 30,000 tons per annum offtake agreement should become a binding agreement. And 30,000 tons currently represents uh, well, it's, there's 49,000 tons per annum uh, predicted from the scoping study. So that's a, a large uh, portion of the offtake that would be signed up front for five years. It doesn't commit the company uh, for more than five years, which is good because if graphite prices do explode, 
uh, given the EV um, and graphene and, and, and energy storage um, backdrop, then they can strike higher um, basket prices. So this is good. And so there's another 19,000 tonnes potentially of additional offtake agreements they could sign up from. And if the client uh, that signed the 30,000 tonnes per annum likes the product enough, they perhaps might take the other 19. So um, Armadale in a good place here and to have that MOU already in place. And then the mining license, so permitting the application itself and the mining license approval, this should all happen over the course of 2019. The ESIA environmental completion and submission will happen in Q2, so that should be happening fairly soon. Uh, and then the yeah, mining license application will go in mid-year um, with uh, uh, hoping to have a 2019 approval and a decision to mine um, by the end of the year following completion of the DFS and the permitting. Uh, which would lead us into construction financing and on to construction and becoming a producing company. So it's a very exciting year for the company, plenty of catalysts there, plenty of value triggers and you can see why the company scaled back the place and significantly because they obviously can see that there are plenty, plenty of value drivers coming here that should make the market cap respond given the very low valuation for the company at the moment versus peers and versus project potential. So to, to summarize the investment case then, why have I invested in Armadale? Why would someone else want to invest in Armadale? Well, here's a few reasons why you might want to. A refocused business <clears throat> management and strategy. Out with the old, in with the new, new project, potentially world-class project, uh, and a decent management team <clears throat> running that. Company have established Mahenge Liandu Graphite Project, a world-class, high-grade, large flake, high-purity graphite mine in a prolific mining region in Tanzania. Advances in Tanzania mining and mining commission established in April 2018, which has led to a reduction in political red tape and neighboring black rock mining recently received their licenses. So this is an important point I wanted to touch on. Some people were a bit nervy about Tanzania. There's been a history there, but this is mostly related to gold projects in Tanzania. Graphite is very much a uh, you know a functioning part of Tanzania, and you know BlackRock recently received their mining license, which is a fantastic sign for Armadale and a good de-risking uh, metric for me. Uh, if you look on Armadale's tweets, you'll also see coverage of another company in the Tanzania graphite space that also received their mining license. I can't remember the name off the top of my head. So this bodes <coughs> very well for the company and de-risks me as an investor. Highly attractive, I would say extremely highly attractive project economics. You know, we've touched on it. 350 million MPV, 35 million capex, IRR of 122%. Payback 1.2 year, 32 year mine life, low cost curve, OPEX costs, <coughs> excuse me, $400 per ton. Those are incredible, incredible economics if they feed through into the DFS as expected. So, um, very attractive for me when I look around other junior resource stocks and make comparisons with their project economics. Of course, you know, the risks are that you still have to complete the permitting the environmental side and get the mining license um, but and obviously the DFS needs to um, you know uh, confirm the scoping study assumptions but the early indications uh, are, are, are very appealing to an investor. The macro backdrop. Graphite is expected to see increased demand, demand from EV and graphene sectors, storage sectors as we talked about um, you know, it's the dominant material in lithium ion batteries. It, graphite is in a good space uh, and, you know, interesting to me as an investor and hence I like the backdrop and I wanted exposure to graphite and this is how I believe I can get it. I'm going to have to be a bit patient until they're producing, but this is what early stage investment's about. A strong board, you know, alignment with over, um, you know, with over 22% of the company held by the company insiders. You know, I've had a few email communications with the board. I've been very satisfied with answers that have come back. Um, they've told me that they're going to be, uh, you know, ramping up the PR and making sure that uh, investors are kept up to date with the progress on this project. 
no sort of down troubles for six months and not hearing a word. We will get a lot from this company going forward. So they realise how good this project is. Um, they will be communicating that to the market. And uh, you know, people like myself picked up on the story and others will too. Um, and I expect that to, in itself, uh, the visibility to start driving out value for the company going forward. Um, short forward share price catalyst, something I always look for in a company. It's no point investing in a company if they're not going to be doing anything for two years. 2019 is pretty much brand packed. Uh, plenty of news flow to come, as you've seen on the roadmap that I just covered. You can flip back and have a look to that. Um, plenty of news there and plenty of significant news that should be able to re-rate the company share price going forwards. And then, of course, this, you know, this culminates in the DFS completion and the decision to mine by the end of 2019, and that would put the company in a very strong position. They're funded for the 2019 program, so we don't have to worry about any additional raises um, coming to the market in the short term. But even if they were to raise more money, they've just executed a, a, a placing um, a half the money that was offered to them at the market price. It wasn't a discount, it was at the market price. Investors decided to invest because they saw the proposition and were prepared to take the risk um, of investing up front. And that's a testament to the project and the company and you know everyone involved. So um, you know and it's good to see that the company didn't just overly dilute to fill the board's pockets. Um, they took what they needed because they realised that the company will be worth more, should be worth more, and you know if you need to go back to the market for funds at some point, you do it at a higher level. <clears throat> worth, to note, worth noting also that that fund raise came with warrants, so the share price appreciates as I expected to. The company can collect another one and a half million pounds <coughs> via the warrants anyway at 2.2 pence per share. So. They have limited dilution already by setting the warrant price there. Uh, okay, I think that covers the uh, investment case. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, there's quite a lot to digest there. So flip back and forward through the video. See if you find it interesting. By all means, send me some comments on, on, on the video. I like the company. I like the project. Um, very attracted to the economics and the graphite space. So it fits my bill from that perspective. And um, yeah, I hope you find the video of use.